thought that it would be appropriate to, to uh, start to provide a very brief introduction of the Turkat interchange and on the debate surrounding uh, its reconstruction. Very factual, very quick. Some of you might not be familiar with the, uh, the infrastructure, so I would read, you know, like just a few uh, basic facts. So, uh, the Turkat interchange was commissioned in uh, 1967, just in time for the opening of uh, Expo, uh, the exposition in uh, 1967, you know, so the times in, uh, in Montreal, or modern Montreal. So, it, at the time, it was one of the largest uh, interchange in uh, North America. Uh, it is located uh, in St. Henry, where it connects uh, to Highway 15, 20, 720, uh, so known as Bill Mary. Uh, the structure culminates at some 30 meters above the ground and uh, accommodates a total of uh, 18 lanes of uh, traffic that are distributed between 12 ramps, so it's quite uh, large. Now it is part and the heart uh, of a uh, larger complex even, which is made up of four interchanges, and uh, they're connected, you know, like associated highways. So that's 28 structures, uh, 160,000 uh, square meters, 7.7 .7 kilometers of ramps that are spread on three levels. So we're talking about a gigantic, uh, uh, you know, like uh, infrastructure here. Uh, now the turbulent interchange, you know, at the art of this complex is crumbling. Currently, you know, it needs to be uh, replaced, rebuilt. So there is a, like a consensus on that. So that in, in 2007, the uh, Ministry of Transportation of Quebec, the MTQ, made a reconstruction project uh, publicly known. Uh, eventually, this uh, was the object of a public hearings at the FAP, you know, like the Bureau de Sciences Publiques en Environnement. And uh, the proposal of the MTQ, as was mentioned before, you know, elicited much criticism from citizens, community groups, experts, and even public uh, bodies uh, for its uh, failure to meet minimal, according to such uh, critics, you know, its failure to meet uh, minimal environmental, social, economics, uh, sustainability standards. Uh, so I will now turn to Victor, who uh, studied, you know, like uh, the, uh, the question. And uh, I was uh, quite fascinated, Victor, when we first met you and had this exchange about uh, your work, the way in which you uh, became interested into the Turkish interchange and, and, and uh, you know, like the debates surrounding its reconstruction, and uh, how this uh, triggered, you know, like uh, an interest which became part of your work and produced, you know, like a significant piece of work. So I would like it. I was interested, and I think that people would be very interested in hearing. Uh, about your démarche artistique or the process, you know, and uh, as I understand it, it's, it is uh, twofold. You know, there are two. Uh, so can you talk uh, to us about it? Yeah. Uh, so I'm not uh, very used to uh, speak in this context. It feels so wrong. I wish I could like talk like that, but I think that supposedly you guys don't listen anything, right? Okay. So how to use this? Uh, so, uh, I don't know how many of, 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 of uh, here uh, it actually have a chance of, of seeing the work that was displayed. Uh, but it is, um, well, it comes from, from uh, I would say, two different uh, uh, questions that I was having back more than a year ago. Uh, it was coming from a quest of um, expanding, uh, it might sound a little bit uh, arrogant, but that's not the intention. I was trying to expand the form of documentary filmmaking practices a little bit by twisting the, the form a little bit. At the same time, uh, I was uh, interesting in the triple uh, interchange issue uh, and this is coming i have to say it's coming from Daniel cross which is here present uh is, is the guy here in the front row with a little hat he's uh, uh in my opinion one of the most important documentary filmmakers of canada that's hands down uh and he's been working on a lot of material about the triple interchange like for the last what like five years or something like that and the documentary is continuing as 
the true God is continuing. Uh, so I became, I became interested in the issue thanks to him. At some moment at graduate school, I was thinking about, in a very theoretical level, how do I, um, I wouldn't say innovate, but how do I start using the documentary form in a different way that it's a little bit far from the conventional viewing um, a spectacle settings from the 19th century, which is you have a very conventional narrative which has a beginning and the end. It really doesn't matter how avant-garde you get, but you go to a home, uh, you go to a theater, and you have a, a very uh, a fixed screen, and you have a fixed duration, and you have to watch it just from a single point of view, and you have to only get one screen <coughs> at a time, right? Uh, so I was thinking, how do I? And then through the research, uh, then later on, I was hired as a research assistant for that. So I was thinking, how do I convey all these different kinds of information, which you have archival footage, and you have interviews with people, and you have uh, tons of academic uh, writing, and books, and quotations. So I was thinking, how do I convey all this information into a single viewing experience? Uh, of course, you can do that in in a, in, a, in a documentary, but you have to go through the whole thing and wait until it passes like 10, 15 minutes and you get to that, which is, I'm not diminishing, but it's just trying to offer something different. So I realized that the installation uh, format it was the most convenient way of doing that. So I asked Dan permission, I was like, you know what, I'm going to go and do my thing. Is that okay with you? And he was like, yeah, sure, go and do it. So I went and I did it, and I disappeared like four years, right? Uh, and then uh, he got mad at me. He was like, oh, I don't know, you've been away for a year or something. I was like, well, I'm, I was on the truck, right? So, uh, so I spent uh, roughly a year at uh, Pierre Solivet's uh, place, which he's sitting here at the front row as well. Um, using different techniques, uh, using a little bit of oral history techniques, and I didn't want to just come and do an interview. And it's like, okay, give me the goods, right? What's what's the big thing about the truth? Code? So I spent roughly a year at Pierce, and the technique that I would do if people are not familiar with oral history is just basically just get a different kind of uh, relationship with your subject, right? So uh, you, uh, because I, I would say that one of the original scenes of documentary is exploitation, right? That's, that's a, the, the biggest and the most important issue always in documentary, how exploitative you, you are, why are you using your subject for your own artistic endeavors, and so on and so on. So the oral, the oral history technique allows the filmmaker to uh, achieve a more profound relationship with the subject. And one of the aspects of that technique is just let the person speak. So you have to be with the person hours and hours and hours and days and weeks and then weeks becomes months and in this case you don't hear. And so you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and so it, it's, it's a great thing to do. So, uh, so uh, I wasn't, at that moment, of course, I was doing the part that it's considered the research. I, I, mean, I was shooting, I was with him. I wasn't thinking really, okay, the installation is gonna be that, or the installation is gonna be that. I was really not completely unaware of, of the way the installation is gonna work, how many channels, like I have completely no idea whatsoever. You, you, you described this, these interviews with Pierre Zubili as being the the flesh and bones experience of the resident, because Pierre Zubin is a resident, he's an artist, and he's living nearby. And as a matter of fact, uh, he's part of these people who uh, buy very well the for right? Yeah. Which, which connects to this other aspect of your work, which is more theoretical. I think that you were about to discuss, uh, discuss it. You know, the, you discussed the notion of 
displacement, which was very interesting and inform your work, you would be definitely to talk about it. Sure. And, and that's the other aspect of the research, right? Because we are now in this, I'm sure here, most of the people are academic, so we are very aware of the notion of multidisciplinary research, research creation and stuff. So, so, so I would put the, the hub of the activities when I was with Pierre Sauvillet, and you know, uh, ugly boots, and just be there at the Turco, like freezing cold, and trying to experience a little bit the flesh and bone experience of a person who lives right there. And then I will go back at home, dressed like I'm dressed right now, and go to Concordia University and start, uh, you know, like graduate uh, work and writing papers and stuff like that. So that's basically one of the, I would say, the two most important aspects of, of, of my uh, video work. I don't know if that's, that's, that's the, yeah. the, the question. So, um, you are not required in all graduate schools to do so, but I decided to compile and to read and to be quite well informed academically of uh, your material theories of the city, uh, sociology, anthropology, and of course uh, the work of Pierre Gautier is uh, foundational. Uh, as well, the work of Pierre Wisse, who is present here as well. And, I, you know, tons of people that are working on mobilization of course, the social activist movement. So, um, I don't know, I, I think that's what people find interesting in Concordia um, when I presented here as a value thesis. Um, so, so, yeah, and then basically, the, the way that all the installation came together, that was actually a very, it was actually, I think, the fastest part of the process. Uh, I just, uh, uh, I just got the idea that, oh, I'm gonna play with boxes. And I have to, like, not exactly, now I'm trying to understand why the idea of the boxes, but at the beginning it was just like, okay, boxes. Just because I was, I don't know. I remember very well that moment and I was having a cigarette and it was like minus 20 and I was speaking with a colleague and I was like, yeah, I'm going to play with boxes. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, but then the boxes become a very, uh, really integral part of, of the big installation. So, uh, and you, you will show us picture because the yeah. installation was featured here. It included video and then uh, you know, the images that from that installation that will allow you to talk about it. So the, the title of the name was uh, Turcut 2.0. Yeah. And we can come back later on this notion of displacement, you know, like if you, if you wish, you know, which is the theoretical uh, aspect. Sure. And this is, uh, this is Pierre on, on profile. Uh, so you can see he lives uh, in this building in San Remy Street. And when you are at his places, you have the Turco interchange like right. It's like you see the interchange all the time. Uh, so it, it really uh, becomes a, uh, for, for the people that live there, a very almost surreal experience, right? To, uh, you know, to have the, the, the interchange uh, right there. And I decided to uh, actually not use that vantage point of view fundamentally uh, on the video installation that, that shot, uh, I think it, uh, it's only like, I think it's like 40 seconds from the whole installation, right? But uh, what interested me the most was trying to convey uh, different ideas and different uh, moments in history that I discovered through, 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 my, through my research. Uh, one of them will be uh, to highlight that this will be the second time that this displacement happens. Right? Uh, it already happened back in the 60s and 70s, uh, like through all the a little bit 50s, 60s, 70s with different uh, mega urban projects. It involved with the construction of the Ville Marie and later on with Chuka as well. So the initial, as you switch images, the initial project entails for creations. And there's footage that exists, for instance, in this city, uh, Arcon. Yeah. Movie, you know, uh, right. the genre, the blue, the right, right, right. So, uh, uh, so that's uh, so the installation. It, it 
it's uh, comprised of four, four, four uh, video channels. Two of them are shown in archival footage, one from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and the other one is from archival footage. Uh, and that, I mean archival because I didn't shoot that myself uh, from like five years ago until today. And then the other two video uh, channels uh, that are something like that. Uh, and that's, that's my footage. Uh, and uh, a, a very interesting, uh, one of the most interesting things that I discovered in my research is that the first process of displacement that happened like 45, 50 years ago, it is actually, it has the same characteristics of the displacement displacement that is going to happen right now. Uh, there was a, a social activist movement against the construction of the mega urban project. It was called uh, Noah for Food, something like that. Uh, there was a group of filmmakers and video artists working on that, which was under the NFB uh, Channel for Program Change. Uh, so you, you find m m many similarities in, in between, uh, even though it's like 50 years in between. Uh, so that was an interesting thing to to come across. And, and the video installation attempts to do that. Because obviously, as, 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 a, as a video artist, and when you have, a, 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 let's say, a long video piece, mine is like almost 40 minutes you're not always expecting people to actually see it and go through the whole thing. But you, I was expecting only for people probably to pass by, get a glance. And people that don't know what the truth code is, just to try to bring a little bit of awareness to the issue. And they would say, oh, truth code, what's truth code? And they would just get a glance, like, oh, is that, oh, and is there something going on there? And probably they would just Google it, and they would try to uh, get a little bit more of information, right? Because one of the things that happened uh, a lot of me, what was, and it's still happening with me right now, is uh, people ask me, oh, what, what did you do? Or what have you done? And I'm like, well, I'm doing a true code. And people don't know what a true code is. They're like, true code? What's true code? And I'm like, uh, do they interchange? Like, <laughs> when you're coming into Montreal, the thing that you're driving, that huge thing, that's a true code. Oh, really? And what's going on? Like, oh my god, really? No clue. Uh, so that was one of the part of uh, that, that I really wanted to do with this installation, just to try to bring a little bit of, uh, just to spread out the work a little bit out there. And, uh, and that said, it's trying to bring a little bit of awareness to it. There's part of it is political engagement. And these are the boxes that you were referring to uh, yeah. earlier, right? Yeah. So the, the video was uh, is using these as a screen for uh, the presentation of the video? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, for different reasons, there was a way as well. There was an aesthetic concern, but there were uh, also a political concern, and of course, there's a symbolic factor for uh, all the people that are going to be displaced. Uh, well, you get your life into boxes, right? So, suddenly so your, your life it can be contained easily in 20 of those boxes, right? So, which to me is one of the biggest crimes of uh, contemporary society. <coughs> of course, there are more important issues and probably more, uh, uh, I wouldn't say important, but more uh, um, of, of more political uh, concern, like uh, narco traffic, like uh, you know, First Nation. Like, there's tons of issues, uh, but from my perspective, the issue of displacement in contemporary society is it's one of the biggest issues because it's, it's an issue that you can uh, find, and, and because of mega urban projects, right? It's happening all over the world. It's happening in Hong Kong, it's happening in Mexico City, Montreal, you name it, it has happened in tons of cities. To me, that's almost like a crime. At uh, the receiving end of the equation, uh, to me, you know, like these boxes and the lines as well, you know, like the um, um, 
these are what they're, they're modular, right? They're modular so that they can fit into containers, so they can. So it's a they're a symbol of efficiency yeah. and transportation yeah. as well. For sure. So my, you know, deformation as an architect and as a planner may be <laughs> read that into into your work. But uh, we're we're allowed to do, but it's far more sophisticated than that, as you you just mentioned, because they symbolize uh, this place. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the work of, of urban planners was having for my, my own process uh, big time. Uh, uh, what he ever said, uh, and of course, I uh, use many urban theories and uh, urban sociology, just trying to inform me a little bit more about this, these processes. Uh, not only this placement, but what the city, what the city is right now. Uh, because I, I, I think that one of uh, a very interesting aspect of the cities right now, I, I think cities are a strategic uh, sites for, you know, for a global economy, right? Uh, there are so many economical and political forces in the city that it's just, um, we are, uh, as, as citizens, we just cannot escape uh, that influence. And, you know, I, I do feel a little bit of responsibility of talking a little bit about that, and in this case, it's an artistic form. Uh, but I'm sure uh, Gautier has the same concerns, but he uses the academic uh, milieu to express those concerns. Maybe we could uh, talk a bit about... Uh, For sure. Uh, For sure. Do you want to talk to this? No, 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 no. So we can, we can come back. Oh. Uh, so my, my work on Turka basically started when I was working with my uh, urban planning stu uh, students in a studio. We were working in St. Henry in 2007-2008. And as we were, you know, like trying to understand the, uh, the issues of planning issues, the potential for revitalization and so on, and the, the social, economic, and material, physical context of St. Henry, uh, we, uh, this project, you know, like was made public from the Ministry of Transportation. So first we were trying to understand the nature of the project, which was completely difficult to do because, I mean, people that were there at the beginning could testify about the fact that, that it was made, you know, to allow for uh, the uh, understanding of what was being proposed. You know, the documents were not uh, amenable, they were not, you know, like, uh, were very easy to, difficult to interpret even for Special, a specialist like, uh, like myself. Uh, and uh, so we're trying to understand the nature of the project itself and obviously its implications for uh, the local population and the, the impacts on, on urban planning uh, or the, uh, on their, you know, like the potential, uh, like the, the, the uh, planning, you know, for the area, if you wish. I was also involved at the time with the uh, Community University Research Alliance uh, project that was uh, studying the mega project, the MUH McGill University Health Center uh, project, which is just next to the Turka Center interchange, which just happened to be just next to it. So we were basically looking and trying to understand what would be the impact, positive and negative, trying to uh, capitalize on the presence and the uh, uh, mitigate the, uh, the um, negative impacts and capitalize on the presence of the uh, hospital, the new hospital for local communities. St. Henry, uh, Westmount, and uh, MDG. So it became, it soon became very evident for the community groups and researchers involved in that project that Turcot would have a very important, and I should say negative impact on the surrounding neighborhoods, as well as on the, the, the broader Montreal context. You know, like as the more we knew about the project, the more perplexed we, we became, and, and at some point, you know, quite alarmed. Uh, eventually, the, the discussion has expanded as we got in touch with transportation experts, environmentalist groups, even public health uh, experts, you know, from the, uh, uh, you know, the project, which are basically working for the Quebec government. And, and I should uh, mention here that the, the bad hearings really triggered such uh, a collaboration, you know, like uh, exchanges. And, um, we uh, eventually, you know, it's, as far as I'm concerned, you know, like this work has culminated, uh, culminated, you know, after the back hearings and so on, we continue to make representation, to work, to study, to try to understand the multiple implications. And, 
And at some point, this work uh, culminated in my, uh, as far as I'm personally concerned, with the, uh, the work, the, pro the, the production of an alternative scenario with Pierre Pisse, who's here, uh, who's an architect, which was uh, presented as, uh, with the title, uh, Turka 375. So there's a video which is accessible on, uh, on YouTube, uh, which was done by David, the director is David Chidori, which summarizes you know, this, uh, the old episode, if you wish, and explains you know, what we were trying to do, and uh, how we, we came to the conclusion that perhaps, you know, like illustrating how the principles that we were advocating for and coming to groups were advocating for could inform the project, because we felt that uh, such, a, such, a, such a thing wouldn't come from the, the, uh, the MTQ. But now, as, as, as time passed, uh, obviously, um, I started to, to reflect, as, as you did, Victor, in, in your work, you know, on uh, trying to understand what Turcotte says about, about Montreal, as you, you would put it yourself, uh, and more broadly, how uh, highways are shaping in cities uh, in ways that we do not necessarily uh, suspect you know, in the first time. The more it went, it, 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 it went, you know, as a researcher, I was interested in, in, in well, in my specialty is looking at the uh, material culture, the evolution of the built environment over time. And uh, which means, you know, I'm also teaching in urban design, physical planning, which is a natural uh, extension of this uh, research work. Uh, but it's also about looking how people engage with the built environment and how the built environment supports and favors you know, social interaction, social transactions, and so on and so forth. You know? But even if I focus you know, like research-wise more on the actual built forms, you know, it is, uh, I'm doing so in a way and trying to understand the cultural debt and how you know, streets, for instance, or buildings are uh, manifesting cultural forms that have you know, like broader implications and that have deep roots in the minister. As far as the, uh, the, the highways are concerned, you know, when starting the reflection was triggered by the Turkic interchange debate and so on, then it was a matter of seeing, you know, I came to see these, I had such a highway as a concrete manifestation, as you did, you know, like of broader forces that impact the, the social, uh, you know, like fabric of our cities. And, uh, and but also, you know, as I said, you know, like the, the, the physical fabric of our of our uh, cities. Not to mention, obviously, the environmental impact that are they're very important. They're documented. This is where public health experts, you know, like come into the debate, for instance, uh, and, and that's documented. But uh, I think that to understand the, uh, you know, the fact that the um, that this manifest, you know, like. Uh, you know, like forces that shape our city that are broader, you know, associated with, with capitalism, associated obviously with uh, industrialism, you know, like at, at first and so on. You know, well, this is well documented. We know that these forces are out there. We know that they are uh, shaping and reshaping on our environment. We know that they entail commodification of everything. And, and so that that the built environment becomes commodified, you know, doesn't come as a surprise for for anybody. You know, like this has been discussed in the literature for years and years and years. But I think that to understand the uh, there's another uh, uh, angle that could be taken, and maybe at the next slide, you know, will allude to this: is that the way in which the highways are uh, conceived, you know, or the way in which they're designed. They're functioning to uh, the, the, the city and so on. The way in which you know engineers approach that, or, or transportation planner, uh, has very deep historical roots. It, it goes at the origin of uh, modern uh, planning, basically, which was trying to articulate a response to the Victorian industrial city, with all the problems, you know, and pollution that entail overcrowded cities, industrial production at the heart of the city, and so on and so forth. And, and then, of course, it was also, there's another aspect to it. It's that it's, it's uh, you know, like in a, uh, the work of Haussmann, for instance, in Paris comes in mind. You know, where obviously we were, uh, it's a marvel when you visit Paris and the Grand Boulevard and so on. But if you're a bit more familiar with the work of Haussmann, as many of you uh, certainly are, uh, you realize that Haussmann, you know, was 
approaching the problem of the city in a very different way, very systematic way, as a technical problem, basically. And the city was uh, looked at and, and, and seen as a series of technical problems of networks, technical networks, the word networks, the sewage system, the park networks, you know, you develop parks, you know, that and you can see these parks as part of a network, you know. Very systematic in its approach, you know. It's like a new res rationality uh, was at play uh, there, which is quite interesting. And this is, you know, what's the, basically, that's, that's the connection. If you go to the next slide, you know, like there's this notion as well that, you know, trying to react into the, 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 the industrial city, then a certain number of solutions emerge. One such a solution, you know, entail transforming drastically the, the city center according to new principles, principles of efficiency and so on and so on. Applying, you know, like if a, a, a uh, let's say, a rationality that was applied, you know, in the industrial production to the design and the development of cities. So this is what we see with the Corbusier here on the left. And then uh, this uh, German uh, uh, guy that, uh, please be, uh, don't ask me to pronounce his name. Okay, then we can go, it's El Ilber Sieber, I guess, but probably wrong. And then there's this other image. So that's one, that's part of the equation. And then in the next image, we see that another answer was to fluted from the city and to try to build, you know, like uh, a new life in the suburbs. It's basically, it's, it's just marking the, uh, the distinction between the domestic sphere, which was relegated outside the city and to di differentiate it, you know, like uh, from the work uh, sphere, you know, and the acti associated activities, production activities that would be conducted in the city center at first and then in dedicated uh, areas uh, after that. Okay. So, so this is this is a, 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 a um, the, the 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 general approach. But it's this is extraordinarily uh, pernicious because what you realize is that in the, the daily activities of planners and so and, and uh, transportation planners and engineers and so on, when you start conceiving uh, the city and the transportation networks in the city, you know, as such as technical networks then the street becomes one component of this technical device. It's only one component. And then the way in which the street is used, you know, becomes a function of, you know, the role that it plays within the more complex system. So, uh, and, and highways function very well, you know, when they're part of a hierarchy system. Because they're designed and the, the, there are mathematical models that are used to try to predict the, uh, the way in which people would behave, which is based on the gravity theory, which is basically a theory, a mathematical theory that, that was developed, you know, to understand how water sheds are functioning. So it's like, you know, basically plumbing. <coughs> so, but there's, there is an implicit theory of city behind such an approach, which I just laid out. And this is very pernicious because in this, in such a, it is pernicious because it goes against 8,000 years of urban civilization. Cities were always meant to ensure, uh, you know, the circulation of people from the beginning. But the streets, I mean. But the streets were also, you know, open in order to have lots and, and buildings that had their address on it. As a consequence, you know, they're also, they're part of the, 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 the collective, um, public collective space network. They're a place where people convene, interact. You know, they're basically uh, the background and the, they serve and accommodate, you know, social interactions and so on and so forth. And this is what is lost. And uh, to, to conclude on this, you know, uh, you know, when this, the, the, this in Montreal, for instance, in this master plan, in 1992, referred to Montreal as a city of villages. There were far more, in my mind, in this expression than a quaint image. It's that, you know, the Montreal culture lays for a significant part, in my mind, and really, in the, read it, you know, like in the fine folds and articulations of domestic spaces and the sideways, uh, sidewalks, the streets, the church. Uh, church steps at the time uh, that are the that are the site of socialization and exchange. You know, it's you know they basically concretize or reify 
in concrete forms, the way in which we're inhabiting the city. And this is, there's a shared culture, you know, behind these architectural and physical form. The way in which the, the houses address the street forms, which is fundamentally different in the Western context than what you find in China, for instance. Okay. There are deep cultural, you know, meaning to these things. And this is what is being under attack when you trivialize, you know, like the city and, and instrumentalize uh, the city fabric and, and commodify it. So this is, well, this is another uh, perspective, if you wish, but I think that it's complementary to uh, your uh, work. Yeah. Uh, another aspect that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in uh, doing this kind of research is just to uh, to bring light over the issue of the cultural imperative of this peak, right? Uh, before, uh, uh, there was a journalist asking me, what do you mean by true God reflects the complexity of the city? Uh, what do you mean by the complexity? Uh, and of course it's a complex answer, but <laughs> because it's complex, right? But uh, uh, one of the aspects that interests me the most that I was trying to highlight was the notion of, 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 of a speed, basically. Uh, I think it's Paul Paul Virilio who has written about that issue in Lenki. Uh, and he speaks of the speed as the um, as a privileged notion for the anti CDS tribunal or something like that. Of course he's more uh, uh, he speaks very well. So uh, and she we really continue with the question, she's like, oh but can you like tell me like what about the speed and what's what's the, the, with the city and the complexity? Uh, and it, it's it's actually a, a very simple issue, but sometimes we just uh, like forgot about it. Uh, I was, uh, for example, I was just uh, I'm coming back from Mexico, it's been Mexico for like two weeks or something, and Mexico runs a Mexican economy, stuff like that is like super slow, but really nobody cares. Uh, and, and, and here, well, I'm going to say here more well, but North America in general is like, right, the speed is everywhere. It's like, you are in a line of McDonald's or a coffee, and it's like, do, 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 that in a rush, I'm in a rush, I'm in a rush. Uh, so I explained to the journalists uh, that as a toll. And the toll is that uh, we are used to, to do have a very efficient postal service. Well, that has, has, has a cost, and the cost is higher. And the highway, no, the highway, the inner city highway, which is just breaking the social fabric of the city because the city is a privileged place for social interaction, for meeting people, right? But you want to have, uh, you know, you have, you want to have a speed, you want to have your stuff delivered on time, you want to have everything super fast because here in Montreal, in any city in North America, you can think of any good, and you will find it, right? Uh, should we, and that these are very interesting examples, you know, that add to and contribute to the discussion. Should we open the question? For sure. Since we have um, actually a new government in place now, do um, you think this is going to affect uh, the evolution of the project? I mean, I'm, I'm sort of hoping that um, the, the politics of the MTQ might have changed now that the, the employees have changed. So, That's a big, big question. I don't know. We don't know. That very little has transpired. Uh, so, I think that they have a view, a different approach for transportation. They envision a different policy. Now it's a minority government. Will they do? What, do they want to reopen the file? You know, that could be come back during the election and so on, because it's, it's such a complex project that it's not very well understood by the general population. And, and some people have all sorts of conceptions about, about it, you know, people from the suburbs, for instance, and, and, and so on. So, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic because it's a minority government. There's a high, high political risk if you reopen the debate of being accused of dealing in things. You know, if something bad happens, if they have to close a significant segment, for instance, and it falls during the election, you know, even though we know that 
it wouldn't entail uh, you know, necessarily delays in the reconstruction, but, but you want to get into this type of discussion and debates during election if people are cut in their car and are traffic jams in all the widows of South Shore because they have to close, you know, like a very uh, important section of it because there's a, you know, there could, it could be collapsing. Everything is monitored. I don't think that the safety of people is in question here. But they might have to, to, to shut it down, you know, like if, if it deteriorates more like quicker than they anticipated. There's someone at the back. I'm just curious about what's being done in other cities, because in North America, I'm under the impression that in the 50s and 60s, a lot of cities were building highways and interchanges. And I imagine that theirs must be crumbling apart at some point or in need of repair. Are they just replacing it? Why aren't we doing that? Would that be a better option? Just replace it, no expropriations, no additional cost, no additional volume, maybe nothing for public transit anyway. And I was just kind of curious if you had explored that. Yeah, over well, the year. Uh, I, I, I don't know just one example. For example, the example in Mexico City, they decided to build a second level. Right? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it was crumbling, so they just reinforced the structure. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, I don't remember the exact, the precise technicalities of the Mexico City inner uh, highway, but it is very large, like way larger than Turco. Everything in Mexico City is like, larger than life, right? So you can imagine just this highway that just goes on and on and on and on and on forever. Uh, so the engineers, they you know, face that question that you, of oh, what we will do, we, we need more cars and we need more space, but things is crumbling, what should we do? It's like, if you want to remove that people, it's like, if you're gonna remove like two million people, it's, that's just impossible. So they just add a second one. And of course, a little bit more people were displaced. I really don't know how many, but for sure people, uh, and many people were killed during that, that pool, right? Uh, construction workers, many were killed. There was an excellent documentary, I'm sorry. There, there are opposing forces in different local contexts, you know, like very rapid growth and so on, you know, like the response values. <coughs> but in, in, in the northern hemisphere, generally speaking, when the growth is fairly, fairly modest, as in Montreal, the general tendency when, when governments are serious about uh, climate change and reducing, and this is 40% 40, 40 of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Quebec are, are attributable to uh, transportation. So that's the sector where it grows very sharply, whereas in all other sectors, it declines, you know, like they are real gain. So what, what these jurisdictions and other governments are doing is that you reduce the offer highway road transportation, and you put in place, you know, very efficient uh, public uh, transit uh, systems. And especially with the clientele that is targeted as those who will move back and forth between the suburbs and the city center, for instance. And our research, you know, with the, my research for, uh, for specifically, you know, but good experts, you know, determined that maybe there are up to 70% uh, of the people using the east-west corridor uh, that use it, you know, like for their daily commute. So these are the people that are targeted. And you know what the solution exists? It's to, to, to develop the, the rail towards the, uh, the, the West Island. And it's already studied, you know. So why is it that they don't want to do it? Like, I don't know, we might learn more, you know, like in the coming weeks and, and months. Uh, I don't know. It seems like we're talking about systems here, so I wanted to ask, if, have you studied, um, if you look at the port or the, the tonnage of materials coming into Montreal, how much of that is transferred to trucks and how much tonnage of what goes, for instance, on Ville-Marie is actually commercial traffic and how much of it is, is, uh, is by people, actually? Well, it's it's a very technical question, and Ville Marie, you know, like all sorts of uh, material cannot go there because of the because it's a tunnel for safety uh, reasons and so. On. 
but not much for it in, in Bill Marie. We know that they are, uh, there's a significant uh, like a corridor, you know, the 15 going to, towards the bridge. And when working, you know, we know that there's no uh, quick fix, you know, for that, that problem. And in our scenarios, you know, like we were keeping the level as it is right now, even accommodating growth, you know, the future. So there are more innovative solutions to deal with freight, you know, outside of the road, but we know that there is no quick solution for that. Uh, the solution, quite like a, sh a short term solution, uh, were far more evident, you know, as far as passengers uh, and, and motorists were concerned. But for trucks, you know, like our scenario that would reduce significantly the size of the uh, the interchange and so on would, would still accommodate the same uh, level of uh, freight. No one else has a question. I just had a second question. I think that uh, yeah, real quick. I think that it's maybe one minute. All right. I was just uh, I was just curious. Um, what lessons can we learn from the way the Turcot interchange was, was treated? Let's say the 40 needs replacement, like what do we do now? Do we just give up because the government doesn't really listen to its citizens or the BAP or any recommendations from experts and transit experts? Uh, where do we go from here, you know? Well, I mean, like the, the, the short question is that it needs political courage, you know, because a lot of people will be affected. And in my mind, we need to open up the debate so that the commuters and people who live in the suburbs realize that it's also in their, to their advantage to modify their, their habits, to leave their car at some point and switch to the train and come to Montreal quicker and more efficiently and so on and so forth. And then the effort required by people living in the, the city center is something else. But, but the nature of the effort which is required for a different group of people will be different. So the arbitration in my mind, you know, needs to be done collectively in an open debate where people realize that we are all for virtue, we are, we all we, we all for you know like better environment. We're going, you know, very concerned about, you know, like climate change and so on and so forth. But if people have the sense that their effort you know, need to be different from the effort of their other categories of population, but it's it's shared and it's equitable, and that collectively we, you know, like benefit, you know, that are benefit for different groups of people, and they are also benefit, you know, for the collectivity at large. I think that it's the only solution. But the debate is what I, it's so complex because it's technical. It entails, you know, changing debates between experts, and then it's about changing the habits, and there are political implications if you're trying to get elected, you know, in different parts of town or of the region and so on. So I, in my mind, the democratic uh, process is the, is the answer, you know, and, and making the information available and the options, putting the options on the table. There is no other way. I mean, it cannot be imposed, but still, you know, it takes courage to, you know, like, to say that now, you know, like, we're serious about these things and, and this is, you know, like, change need to occur now. Let's sit down and discuss and figure out how to do it with, you know, like in a short period of time and clear objectives at the end.